Hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. On today's episode, we're going to talk about getting started with FreeBSD. I do hope you enjoy it, and let's get into it. Hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. Today, we're going to look at how to get started using FreeBSD. So the first main step you want to do is, first of all, you want to find a suitable laptop or desktop. Now, the main thing uh, that entails is you want to go on their website, freebsd.org, and look at their hardware requirements and just make sure that computer will work with it and has enough resources. Now, most computers, um, going all the way back 20 years or so, will work fine. FreeBSD works on 32-bit machines, i386, and 64-bit machines, AMD64 architecture, as well as ARM architecture now. But after you've figured out that you have a machine that works, you want to go to the website and download an installer image for that architecture you need for your CPU. Okay, and you'll either get it as an ISO, an, a, an ISO, an IMG file, or they even have uh, raw images for Raspberry Pis and things like that, where you'd put those on an SD card. The ISO, you want to go and burn that to a disk, with the IMG file, you copy that to a USB stick. But, and that is what you do to create the install media. Okay? And after that, you just simply install FreeBSD. So, um, before you um, go and, and do this process, you're going to want to know maybe a little more before you just jump in and do it. So, good use cases for FreeBSD. Number one that comes to mind is routers and firewalls. So, FreeBSD was my f first exposure to firewalling and BSD, and which is why I know about it today, but it, it has good use for that. And I believe even the Juniper uh, routers are based off of FreeBSD as well. Um, it's good for IDS and IPS systems for network security. You can use a supported wireless card and create a FreeBSD based wireless access point. You can also use it as an Ethernet switch, but software based. It'll be a little bit slower, but that is an option. It's very good for servers. A lot of the features are very, very good for servers as well. Um, any server you can think of, DNS servers, mail servers, web servers, etc. And of course, the last one here, the, the one we're talking about today, is a desktop use cases. And this just means we're going to install it and install on top of it a desktop environment so you can interact with it like you would Windows, Mac, or Linux. So um, when you do get done installing, though, it is a CLI or command line interface. So it's just a shell. So there won't be an environment, but we'll see that in a little while. Now, the pros and cons of using it the, and these are my personal opinion. The pros, I would say, one, it has a small footprint. The hardware requirements, I think even at the time of filming this in 2019, is um, 96 megabytes of RAM and like a gig of hard drive space, something like that. And, you know, that's very small in my opinion, especially nowadays. And uh, secondly is consistency. Across all the three CPU architectures and, and other things like that, it's very consistent, and you can install on an SD card, it will be the same, a CF card, or a normal hard drive, and, you know, you have a very good, pristine, consistent environment. Now, going along with the consistency and the reason it's like that, is when the developers, the developers develop the kernel and user land together, so the kernel being the brains that communicates with all the hardware and orchestrates it, and the user land is all the programs on there that we use to get work done, um, they develop it together so it doesn't get out of sync very often. You know, other systems can get out of sync and cause incompatibilities and instability and things like that. But it is also optimized for heavy workloads. This means it uses RAM very, very well. It has... SMP, symmetrical um, multiple processor support, so SMP. So it, the code in there is very good at being multi-threaded on different cores. 
of CPUs. So also they have great, great documentation and they have a handbook and everything and it's very good documentation, very easy to follow. And they have many different devices that are supported. Now what I mean by this is the different drivers they have developed over the years for all different types of hardware like um, hard drive interfaces, network cards, and wireless cards, and all these different things. Now, <clears throat> that does mean there's more flexibility in the amount of hardware you can use with it, okay? Now, number seven is process security. Now, this is uh, comes hand in hand with running servers and things. They have something called jails, and jails are like a change route but very much enhanced. So it's kind of like separated in the way a VM is separated from a main um, computer running it. But the jail is able to be like audited and separated out. So you can have an entire, you can have the main FreeBSD system. And then you can have two other jails, let's say, that are in entire copies of a FreeBSD system in their own right. They can have their own IP address and everything, but they can't talk to each other unless you let them. And also, if they're broken into, it's still a jail. So the intruder cannot necessarily get out of there very easily. Now, the last pro is binary system upgrades. And I believe FreeBSD was one of the first um, BSDs to do this, as far as I can remember, at least. So... Binary system upgrades, you use a program, FreeBSD-Update, and there's uh, it downloads pre-compiled versions of the new software when they do a release, the kernel, the user land, and all that. Or if you have a security problem, that program is just compiled for you. You download the new binaries and install them in place, and then just reboot. It's much quicker than having to patch the source code on your system and then recompile all of it and reboot especially on firewalls and servers that have to be up almost constantly. Although, there is cons. And, you know, these are my personal opinions of me using it as a desktop, me using it as these things, and, and seeing these things for myself. But, the packages and ports breakage. Now, is this FreeBSD's fault? Not necessarily. I mean, but it's, it's very easy to have happen because it gets confusing. You can install pre-compiled uh, programs with packages or you can get the ports tree after you install and install everything from source code and customize it, okay? If you install some code from an outdated ports tree and then try to install the packages that are maybe dependencies of that code, things can get very broken with a lot of different software in the system in general. So you do have to be careful there, but that is something I've encountered. Secondly, is a uh, supported CPU architectures. Now they, I think the, the main amount they support, there's at least i3d6, AMD64, and um, ARM v6 on their website at the moment. But that just means it can't run it as on as many different types of CPUs. But going back to the pro, it makes up for that because it can run it can interact with a lot of different hardware on those architectures. So, you know, they, they make up for it in a different way. Now, software outdated or missing. I know this is a sticking point, but um, in my experience with it, I've had software where I cannot... The, the compilation breaks, things like that, and it, it's just gone or very outdated. This is not the FreeBSD's developer's fault. Okay, it's not FreeBSD's fault. The extra software is ported by individuals that do it in their free time, just like FreeBSD is developed in everyone's free time. So, it's not their fault, but it can be a con, unfortunately. So, again, drivers outdated and missing. Occasionally, if it's new hardware, just like any operating system, you'll see a driver that isn't there or maybe is outdated and makes that hardware when it's interacting with it unstable. But the last one, 
in in my opinion, is the upgrade path for different releases. Now, this is my personal uh, fault here with this, but I downloaded Stable at one point, you know, years ago. And I didn't realize, at least as far as I know, you can't use binary patches on Stable. You have to compile from source. Now, I did this on a laptop, and I installed a bunch of other stuff and made it a desktop system. And I only found that out after I had spent all the time compiling. So, you got to be careful there. You can only use um, the binary system upgrades on the release versions of FreeBSD, not the stable versions. Although the stable versions are just that, though. They're potentially you know, more stable. It's the stable code at that time. A release is just a slice of stable. But the last thing, we'll just talk about some resources. Uh, FreeBSD.org is the main website where you can find all this other stuff. The uh, FreeBSD <clears throat> here is the, the other one is where they have um, different resources and things to get started with it. The handbook is below that. They're frequently asked questions. If, uh, the newbies.html is a very good introductory um, guide to this. And the last three are their... Um, source code on GitHub for the kernel and user line. That's what the FreeBSD is. And the FreeBSD-ports is all the ported software in both in the, which you can access from the packages system and from the ports tree. Okay. Um, uh, interesting thing. If you go there and go through FreeBSD ports, you can see ahead of time, how often is the software being updated? So then you can go on and see and kind of combat a lot of those cons I just talked about. You can look ahead of time and see if your software is there for you and being updated. And again, not a fault of FreeBSD whatsoever. It's all in everyone's free time. So it's it's very it's it's very awesome that they do this. Now the last one is the source code again, but I believe just the kernel and the user land. Although the ports may be there as yeah, the ports are there as well. I apologize. But that's just their SVN interface on their website if you didn't want to use GitHub. So, in the next uh, two shorter sections, we're just going to go out to FreeBSD.org, show you how to download it. And then, after that, we're going to make the media, go through the steps to do so, at least the programs you need. And then I'll do a very, very basic getting it, getting familiar with the actual system. So I will see you in just a second. All right, welcome back. So now we're going to go and download FreeBSD. Just uh, in your search engine here, just type FreeBSD. And click the first link here for FreeBSD.org. Okay, and once we arrive here, click the Download FreeBSD button. And down under here, usually the first instance of the FreeBSD and then the version number dash release, um, you, you have the main, main releases they do. If you go down further, though, um, current is the bleeding edge. So if you have a problem with hardware, you can use this here to see if they've um, put more into it. Now, as you can see, the bleeding edge that has a lot more architectures as well. And then those are the SD card images. Now, what, what I wanted to get at, though, this is what I meant about stable, about the different versions. Um, this, this is the one where you have to update from source. You have to patch all the source code and then do the procedure to remake the kernel and user land. But that is all well, well documented in their handbook. But um, what we're interested in is the FreeBSD 12.0 dash release. All we've got to do is, if you have a 64-bit computer, you can click AMD 64. If you have an older 32-bit machine, you can click i386 or any of the other architectures. So, we're going to go ahead and click AMD 64. Oh, and by the way, the, um, the AMD 64 won't run on a 32-bit machine, but if you have 32-bit, it will run on a 64-bit machine. So, just so you know, if you're testing it, you can do a 32-bit. If uh, it didn't work, 
and vice versa. If you try to run 64-bit on a 32, it just won't boot. All right, so usually if you have a CD and you want to boot off optical media, just use disk1.iso. If you want to test hardware and things, use boot only. But we're interested here in the memstick.img because I'm going to be um, showing about the USB stick use case. So we're going to go ahead and click this. Make sure save file is selected. And go ahead and save the file. And I would highly recommend to download the checksum as well. You can do both of these, but usually one is sufficient. But if you want to be extra sure, do both of them. And we'll, we'll go over that in, in one second in the next part. So I'll save the file in the meantime. And while that downloads, I'll uh, let it finish. And I will see you in one second. We'll talk about how to make the media. Okay, so the easiest way to take the IMG file and make the media, you have a few options. You can either use Etcher or um, Rufus. And... Um, Rufus works on Linux or Windows. So, I mean, wherever you are, if you're on Windows right now, or if you're on Linux, it, it's okay. You, you can use either. But I'll, I'll quick show you kind of the idea. The idea is that you put the USB stick in here, and you select it from here, and then you just select either the ISO, if it is a ISO that can either boot off CD or um, USB. In our case, we would put the IMG file there. And then once we've done all that, you just click start and let it run. And then when it's complete, pull the USB out, put it in your computer and boot it up with it. All right. So that is how you make it with um, the, the easiest way to make it on uh, Windows and Linux. And we'll just go over that right down here. It just has the downloads. There, there's lots of different versions and things like that. But anyway, um, what we'll do now is uh, go over, because the download is almost done at this point, and we'll um, make sure it's not corrupted, and then we'll show you what the file looks like. And then after that, we'll start the installation. So I'll see you in one second. Okay, so I made a directory called test, and um, I'm just going to list the files here. And this is the two you want to download, the checksum file and the IMG file in our case, because we want to use a USB. And um, what I want to do is make sure it's not corrupted. So on Linux, we want to use SHA-256-SUM with the switch dash C. And then reference the file after that. So the file has the checksums for each file you could potentially download from that site. And what you should see is the word OK. All right. So we, any any second now, it does take a little bit. And it, it will take longer if you do the SHA-512, since there is more um, bits to have to be calculated over that image with that one, with that algorithm. Okay, um, as you see, FreeBSD and then our memstick IMG file says OK. And that means it's not corrupted. So at this point, you can proceed and you won't have any corruption issues or even malicious modification especially if it's a server, firewall, whatever, you want to make sure it has not been modified in any way. You know, that it hasn't been touched since the developers put it on the server. So, that is how we make that. And now, let me pause real quick and go ahead and grab a USB. Okay, my USB is in there now. And um, I'm going to as well show the instructions for Linux of how to do this. So you want to use sudo fdisk... Um, dash L. And my USB in this case was detected as slash dev slash SDB. And the idea is we want to take, with sudo again, the DD command. And we want to use IF for the input file. Um, but the idea is you want to put in um, the source of the memstick IMG and the output of dev SDB, in my case, the entire disk, okay? Now you can add other switches, like um, byte size, and then you can add 1M, and then that will make it copy faster, and you can also put in there status equals progress. And then if we hit enter on here, it will start to copy. 
Now you see though, because we used uh, by size 1M, it is a little bit faster to start. But anyway, I'll be back in one second. All right, and that's what a successful uh, copy looks like. If there is an issue with DD, you will see input output error. And likewise, if you're on uh, Windows with uh, Rufus, you'll see an error as well. But the idea is the same. The IF files like the same thing as the drop down box, and the output is the same thing as your device uh, menu there to select it. And you know, we just hit start, same as enter. <laughs> but anyway, um, if we do sudo fdisk dash L, now you see different information. And then the devsdb is the boot information, and the devsdb2 is the partition with all of the files of FreeBSD. Helps you install it and has the system archived on there. Now at this point, this is what you just put into your computer and choose as a boot up device, and then it will install. So in the next part, we're going to go through the installer after we get it booted up. So I'll see you there. Okay, now we've booted it up. Now, I will tell you, this is a virtual machine. I'm using VirtualBox to do this. Um, it will be a little bit slower, but everything else is going to be identical on real hardware, whether you boot from a CD or USB, okay? All we got to do, and yours will automatically do it. I actually paused it. But this will go ahead and start to boot up into the install prompt. And as I said, it will be a little bit slower because this machine is doing all the recording at the moment, and running the VM as well, so a little bit slow. But um, I'll go ahead and pause it right here, and I will see you once it uh, boots up. All right, now it's starting to boot up. And uh, this is the D message here. It's basically it telling you all hardware it's found, okay? So, you know, it's an easy way to see if it's not detecting something or if there's an error or anything like that. And um, it'll just go through here and turn on your network cards if it has a driver for them. And it does for ours, and EM01. And again, we're almost there, as I said. Um, your experience on real hardware will most likely be a lot faster than this. And plus, you're not going to be doing, you know, lots of other things when you're installing. Okay, this is the prompt here. There's actually lots of options. There's a shell if you want to do it manually and customize things. There's a live CD if you need to um, rescue a system and other things like that. But we're going to choose install. You just use the arrow keys here and we'll choose enter. Hit enter to select. Now the key map is detecting the keyboard. If you have different needs, select it here. Usually it's okay to continue with the default key map. But if you have questions, just test the default key map. Make sure it's the correct one for your keyboard. But then just hit enter. And uh, this will identify the machine over a network. We're going to just put TTEC in here, but just make sure there's no special characters like hyphens or anything like that. And here is the different um, sets of software. Now, that's the ports tree. This has all the source code to the uh, ported applications. This is the source of the kernel and user land, okay? This is if you want to rebuild the kernel and do other things like that. You usually don't need the test weights, but it's good to know that everything is compiled correctly. And uh, basically, though, we're just going to leave everything um, default because we're going to go over it getting the ports tree if you need it in a different way after we install. So I will see you in one sec. Actually, not yet. <laughs> not yet. I, I actually got ahead of myself. Okay, this is the partitioning, how uh, it will use the disk and make the file system on there. And we're going to actually just use Auto UFS, which is the Unix file system. And if you have different needs, you can also use ZFS. But for this uh, video, don't worry about that for the moment. Just use UFS. We're going to use the entire disk. Um, you can use a master boot record partition. And most systems will boot that, but if you need the newer version, use GPT, okay? And you know what? Let's use GPT. And the, the difference is it has a separate boot partition. And I'll quick explain this. The ADA0 is what the disk is, so that's like your C drive in Windows. On there, the P1, P2, P3 is all the different partitions. So the boot has the kernel and the bootloader. The UFS has the rest of the user land, okay? 
and then that's where that resides. Rather, the kernel and everything is on the slash partition, the root. And that last part there is the mount point. So where the system is going to mount it to access it after it's booted. And the swap is if you run out of RAM as you're using your programs, that's where it stores extra information. Now, if it does that too much, you really need to get more RAM because it's really going to slow down the system just tremendously. So anyway, we're going to finish. And we're going to commit these changes. At this point, make sure you've backed up your information on this hard drive because it's going to format it, and that means you're not going to be able to get it back. So we've done those precautions, so we're going to commit and let it start to format and partition. And now it's extracting, it's uh, loading everything to be extracted. So we'll go ahead and pause it. Okay, we're almost done now. And uh, once this is done, we'll go ahead and um, do the last few configuration steps. Well, I thought we were almost done, though. I turned this off. We're back on. It goes a little slower, but we are almost done, though. And there we go. All right. Now, this is the administrator password, and that's what root is in Unix systems. In Linux or BSD, it's the account that can do everything. Okay. We're going to pick a secure password for the user. And just type the same one twice here. And this uh, part is your network adapter. You want to make sure it's detected, first of all, but in this case it is. And if you had a wireless one, it will detect that as well. And there's, it'll help you set up your wireless network. Um, we want to do IPv4 in this case. We want to use DHCP. And then this will acquire a lease. And that, that is quite harmless. It will just try again to send the packet. And for the moment, we're not going to use IPv6 because we don't have a dual stack or anything at the moment. But we're going to say no. And we're going to tab down to OK. And hit OK there. And then we'll just use America um, all the way down, in my case, and United States, and just Eastern and say yes. We want to skip setting the date and time for the moment. And um, we actually want to use the arrow keys here. And when you get over SSHD, hit the space bar. That unselects that. And the reason is SSH is for a secure shell. It gives you a way to remotely manage the system as root or as any other user. And it's a big target for attackers. So when you're first starting out, especially with a desktop system, you don't need that. There's no reason to have that. It's mostly for servers and firewalls, okay? <clears throat> Now, keep the rest of these selected. You're all right on that. We're going to hit OK. And down here, I would actually recommend disable the syslog D socket. That's for something called remote logging. And again, you don't need that for a desktop system. And you don't necessarily need the security reports that SendMail provides. You can, but most times if we're just starting out, we'll learn more how to analyze that later on as we're getting you know, better with uh, BSD. So we're going to go ahead and hit spacebar and uh, harden that and disable it. And once we've done those two things, we'll just hit enter. We do want to add new users, though, to the system. So we're going to say yes. I'm going to type ttech and accept the default for the full name, the user identifier, identifying number, so the UID. The login group of ttech is fine. Here, though, how I said root can do everything, by default, you're going to have to use a command to get root called su. And to do that command, you need to be in the wheel group. Okay. And leave login class default. You can leave the shell default as well. Home directory is fine to leave. The permissions are fine. As well as the password-based authentication, you do want that. Um, you don't want an empty password or a random password in most cases. Make sure, though, that this password is separate from the root account. So if this account is compromised over SSH or something, which is one reason why we disabled it, even if it's compromised at the, at the actual physical keyboard, you still have security. And it slows them down from getting root. We don't want to lock the account out, by the way. And uh, we're okay with those. 
So we're going to say yes, and we're going to say no to adding another user. At this point, if you need to do other steps again, you can choose them here. But all we're going to do is exit, and we don't need to make any final modifications. We're going to say no there. And at this point, we just reboot. So um, at this point, I'll um, reboot the system and make sure to take your CD or USB out. And at that point, I will see you then, and we'll start very basic configuration. All right, welcome back, and we are all booted up. So we're actually going to log in as that user we created, T-Tech, and give it that password and make sure it's separate. So, what we want to do at first, this is the shell, and what we want to do is type clear and hit enter, and that clears text off the screen for you. The main thing I want you to understand is how to move around. So, we're going to use CD. Well, first of all, let's use PWD for print working directory. Now, in Unix, every user logs in by default to their home directory, and um, that's where we are here. So, if I want to make a directory real quick and make test or something, to move there, I do cd space and then give it test. Now if I print my working directory again, now I'm in test. All right. And um, how you make a file, let's use uh, vi in this case. We're going to use test.txt. The main thing to remember is you hit i to insert, and then we want to type like some text in there. Hit escape, and that gets you out of edit mode. And you can do colon WQ for write and quit. Or you can hold Z and tap the, hold shift rather, and tap, tap Z twice. And then that creates the file. To view files, you can just use cat test and then the file name. And then you can see what's in the file. Now to remove the file, we want to rename it. Let's do next. We want to use move test to like test renamed txt and now it's renamed but to remove the file completely use rm and then hit enter on the file it's gone to go back one directory use cd dot dot and then now we're back to where we started and to remove a directory use rm rf all right you can use just r but then the directory has to be empty if you use f you don't have to worry about that and now that directory is gone so that's a little one-on-one about how to move around and do some basic things with files. Because we're going to need those things to do what we got to do here. So we're going to become root with the su command and type root's password. And uh, what I want to do is c use the CD with no arguments to it, so no options, and then just hit enter. That gets us to root's home directory. All right. The first thing on a new system, make sure you have connectivity with the ping command. We're going to ping Google. All right, and we're getting responses. What I want to do is use FreeBSD update space fetch. This fetches all the updates, those binary patches. This is the difference between release and stable. You can't do this on stable. So we're going to hit enter and let it download for all those components. All right, so when that command finishes, you want to hit Q, and this is called the less program, which is just a pager. And uh, what you want to do is just go down to the bottom, either with the arrow keys or the, um, oh, the page up and down keys. This is all the files that it's going to modify. So after we ran that command, you want to run freebsd-update space install. And now it's going to install all the files it just downloaded. And, and depending on the size of the files and the speed of the system, this will take a little bit of time. But um, for the moment, we'll go ahead and pause this. Okay, just finished. Now, at this point, I should point out um, there's an important command to see your disk usage. So how much space is being used on the file system. You want to use df space dash h. That shows you the amount of room you have available. When we start installing software, this will come in handy. But now what we want to do is type reboot and make sure we're root still. And then hit enter. 
I'll see you in one second. Okay, we're booted back up. Let's go ahead and log back in as that user. And use sue and git root privileges again. Okay, um, you can check the version by using uname space dash a. And what you want to notice is we're on FreeBSD 12.0 release. But what you see at the end is the patch set. So we're actually on P10. So in that case, we are up to date. If you wanted to check again, run those two commands again. Very easy. Okay, what we're going to do now, how I said there was packages and ports, we're going to use the package system at this point. So we're going to run package by itself, pkg, and then hit yes on this prompt, the Y key, to install the package management program. And you, you do have to do this initially. And after that, use package space update. And this updates all the pre-compiled package information. Now this doesn't actually download all of them, but it downloads a file that tells package where to get them from. And it's actually cool, you can even make your own internal server for this and point it there. But anyway, what we want to install at a bare minimum for the system. We're going to start with sudo. Now, why are we using this? And you just hit Y there, by the way. We're using this because then we don't have to give out the root password. And we can also, the accounts that can do things as root have restricted privileges. Okay, I'm restricted scope of what commands they can run. So as a root, though, after that installs, we're going to use vi sudo dash f, and you want to go on user local etsy sudoers. This file controls all of the <coughs> information of, of what the users can run. We want to keep going down. We see user the comment of user privilege specification. Now we can do it by group down there. And by doing that, everyone in the real group can do it. Problem is, I just want this one user to do it at the moment. So that's why I'm doing it this way. That's the advantage of that. All right, and uh, we want to use all equals. And then in uh, parentheses, we want to go ahead and type all again. Close the parentheses, space all. All right. So all commands, and you can run them anywhere as any user. All right. We're going to go ahead and save that file like we talked about before. And now the interesting thing is, if we exit back, and if we run the command, who am I? I'm now the T-Tech user. But watch this. If I want to, let's say, see what packages are installed, now I can run sudo package space info, type the user's password, not root's password. Now I can use that command. If I wasn't in the sudoers file, I would get permission denied. All right. So with all of that, now we actually need to make this into the desktop system we were talking about. So we need to use sudo package install. I'm going to use install xorg Firefox for our web browser. And I'm also going to install something called Fluxbox. And um, the reason is this is easier to show and quicker to set up for the demo. There's lots of other desktop environments and window managers to use, but that's part of the great documentation. Go check all that stuff out for that. And um, we'll go ahead with just that for the moment, because I don't want to overcomplicate things. You can also install a window manager like Slim and then have that start your environment, but we're not going to go through all that at the moment. Okay, we're going to say yes to this. And now it just starts to download everything. I'm going to go ahead and pause this, and um, I'll see you when it finishes. All right, everything is all installed. All the programs we just um, installed. So again, you can see those with sudo package info. Make sure you type the right password, though. <laughs> and uh, it installed quite a few. Now, remember how we installed Fluxbox? That's the window manager, okay? That helps us move windows around, whereas Xorg helps us to control the graphics hardware in our computer, the GPU. So what we're going to do is use the command, where is? 
and we're going to type flux box. Now it is in user slash user slash local slash bin slash flux box. We want to be in our home directory as we are, and we want to use vi again and make a file called dot x init rc. Now this is without a login manager. The login manager, if you install that, does this for you. What we're going to put here is that user local bin fluxbox. Okay. And we're going to save that. Okay, and it should look like so. And you can substitute that for any desktop environment or any window manager you want. Like there's a window manager called Rat Poison that I like. You would just put that in place of that. Now, there's important things about the Xorg configuration, the Xorg server. You can, if you have something like NVIDIA as a graphics uh, processor, you actually have to search for, and we'll do NVIDIA real quick. So you do package search to search for that. And you have to install the NVIDIA driver for Xorg. And then you have to tell Xorg for that video card, the GPU, what driver to use. Now in this case, I have an Intel-based one in this computer. But what I'm going to go through is what you would have to do to make that work. Because at the moment, most times it actually does auto detection. So I believe right out the gate, if we just do start X, that's the command to start the actual server, and we actually went out of went out of frame there. Actually, move that back over. Hope you can see that. This is actually a little bit too big for the VM, but um, this is the the window manager. All right, and then there's our menus and everything, and like there's Firefox, and if we click that, because Firefox was installed as well, all those things will open. But anyway, <clears throat> we're going to exit from here for a second. All right, and then we go back to the shell. Make sure we're centered there. Okay, there is a few more things we have to do, though. So to do the Xorg configuration, we want to become root, and you want to do the Xorg dash configure command. Hit enter on this, and, and it's okay to see the error. But what we're going to do is copy the Xorg comp.new file to Etsy, and then we're going to use vi on that file. So, and actually, let's practice our renaming, because <laughs> we have to rename the file, to uh, xorg.conf, okay? Now we can buy it. And what we're going to look for, the main thing is, I mean, you also do this if you want um, Synaptix, your touchpad driver, you would change the driver here as well, but that's all in the documentation. And um, here is where you would change, here, rather, you change this to NVIDIA after you install the driver into a few other steps in the system. Okay. But those those are few and far between if you have Intel or something like that. We're going to leave that as it is, in my case. And then um, the last thing we want to do is edit at CRC comp, which this is where all the configuration for the system is. And what we want to do is put dbus underscore enable equals and then in quotes we want to put a capital yes just like that and now we can run the command service dbus start and then it starts set up for us so now though if we exit and become a normal user again and if we start x again and I, I do apologize for the view of this but it still gets the point across that, don't worry, yours will be full screen. If we right click, hmm, this one has a funny touchpad. Okay. There we go. 
And we gotta go back up and scroll back up because of course it's not in frame. Um, okay. Th this is the shell. This is a terminal emulator in, in Xorg, in Linux, or BSD. This is what you see to interact with the shell. But from here we can also run the command Firefox right away or we could run it from that menu. So if we run Firefox, and now that we've enabled Dbus, Firefox will start. And again, don't worry about how the screen looks crazy because that is just because it's in a VM and I didn't have the correct settings. But anyway, yeah, this is basically how you use FreeBSD as a desktop operating system. It's not that tricky. From here, you can use different um, window managers if you want. Or you can use um, different um, different applications on top of this. We can install LibreOffice and use that just as easily, or Audacity, or anything like that. But um, that's all in the documentation. And like I said, if you want to search that, all you got to do is uh, you know package space search and then the name. All right. And you can use FreeBSD-Update, as we spoke, to keep the system up to date. Um, one, one last thing. If you, if you wanted... Whoops, that was actually the wrong terminal. <laughs> if you want to keep... Um, so many, so many uh, pointers to look after. If you want to keep... Um, install software in a different way. Instead of using packages, you can use ports. And I'll just show you if you do sudo port snap fetch space extract. And I'm going to interrupt this, but if you hit enter and then type your password, it will fetch the snapshot of ports and then start to extract the ports tree. And you don't always have to do this, but in the past I had a problem with VirtualBox where it didn't have the drivers it needed basically and I had to install it com compile it from ports to fix the issue that's an example of why you'd use it but w with all that that is how you do this and how you make uh, use uh, FreeBSD as a desktop operating system at this point if you reboot you just log in again like we showed you do start X and then it should start X and you're good to go and again if you want to go further you can install login manager and have that start everything up for you and a full desktop environment like KDE or my personal fa favorite, Mate. You can install any of that. And again, check the handbook for that. With all that, I hope this was helpful. Um, as always, I'm Tyler with T-Tech. Hope you enjoyed the video, and have a very nice day.